Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part two of what is turning out to be for me and hopefully for you an epic interview uh, with Kyle Ashworth. Hey, Kyle. Thanks, John. How was lunch? It was great. Thank you. <laughs> we just spent four, four and a half hours with Kyle as he uh, told us about, you know, his uh, Mormon heritage, his Mormon upbringing, and, um, you know, his experience as a closeted uh, suppressed uh, gay Mormon youth growing up in Utah, uh, hyperachiever in high school, um, stumbled upon the the pamphlet that said, "Mission, marriage, and children were the cures to um, his homosexuality." And I say that in air quotes. And so Kyle went on that uh, Mormon hamster wheel, as we call it, and served his faithful mission in Michigan. Got home found uh, his wife, married her, and started having children. <clears throat> and uh, and as he as he says in the notes, he was still, was a super gay? What, what was the word that you used? Hella gay. Hella gay. Um, uh, and and we, we ended our last episode um, with him finding North Star as his, uh, as his last hope. And that's when we were able to dig into the North Star cuddle parties and the North Star experiences. And the way we kind of ended it was just talking about how, in Kyle's view, uh, North Star offers false hope and uh, and just sort of an observation uh, through a discussion of Mormon church history in this phenomenal document on the record, a chronology of LGBTQ plus messaging within the LDS church that Kyle has created. It's a PDF that he keeps on his website, Latter Gay Stories, right? Um, just understanding that the church has over a century of just rebooting the, the LGBT issue, kicking it, kicking the can down the road, and then uh, rebooting and rebooting, kind of like the Microsoft control I'll delete whenever the blue screen of death happens. Uh, so many metaphors. Anyway, so that's kind of how we left it. And uh, I really recommend you guys, all of you, if you care about the LGBTQ issue or not, if you just care about Mormon, Mormon truth claims and LDS church leader claims of uh, revelation and prophetic authority, freaking read on the record uh, the chronology of LGBTQ plus messaging, and there's a new version of it up. But anyway, that's kind of where the first part of this interview with Kyle Ashworth uh concluded. And, um, and there were a few points in the episode towards the end where I stopped you so that we could really flesh out the North star part. But there were two parts that I remember most. One was kind of your, um, your bathtub experience, uh, where you're, you know, after you realize North star isn't working, um, you're starting to listen to Mormon stories, podcast and gay Mormon stories and other podcasts. And you talked, you talked about, sometimes having to step into the darkness to see the light. Let's rewind to pretend you hadn't talked about any of that. And let's talk about, I mean, part two is going to be your, your decisions to move away from this path, basically getting off the hamster wheel. That's part one is being on the, getting on the hamster wheel and staying on the hamster wheel or the rocking chair, as you call it. And I think part two of your interview is, is getting off, getting, getting out of the rocking chair, getting off the hamster wheel and then helping others maybe have a chance of getting off it too. So yeah. where should, where should we begin in your story? Where do we pick up in yeah. your story? Very fair and great analysis. Yeah, so I think what we pick up is the the point where you break or where the wheel breaks or where you realize that you're in a rocking chair. And for me that um as we discussed, I I was reaching out to every available resource uh possible that I could find to try to better understand this experience. And, and North Star seemed to be it because it, it felt most connective to where I was at in a religious sense. It was a faith affirming support group that allowed me to help reaffirm my faith. And North Star provided that for me, but at the same time I, I needed more. And I was, I was out researching trying to find additional stories, trying to find uh, people who are like me that made it outside of the hamster wheel, that paroled, who graduated this 
really difficult space that we were in, um, trying to understand if there were anyone out, anyone else out there that could possibly be a return missionary like myself, who also was a father who was married in a mixed orientation marriage that was trying to make it work. So I, I did lean into a couple of resources. One of those was the Gay Mormon Stories podcast, uh, which was just a, a lifeline to me. I remember reading or listening to um, the Montgomery's um, episode, uh, just a fantastic family who uh, had a gay son who came out and their journey through. John, right? It's, it's Wendy, Tom, and, Tom and, Wendy and Thomas. Yep. And their son's name is? Jordan. Jordan. Jordan, that's right. Yep. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, that was years ago. I mean, yeah. we're talking 2013, 14-ish. Um, this is when Mama Dragons were starting to emerge. Yeah, so this was a long time ago. And and I was deeply entrenched in those stories. Bill Bradshaw uh, did a number of episodes um, with Daniel Parkinson that I just found. And with me. Yeah, it, just incredibly fascinating, uh, dissecting and understanding this experience. Um, so here, here I was, like, just mining through each of these stories, trying to find uh, places where they were congruent, um, but also at the same time trying to to create a path for myself. And I would sit in the bathtub just weeping as my wife is taking care of four kids on her own, essentially, um, trying to figure out exactly why she isn't the model wife, what's going what the issues are in our home that isn't creating connection between she and I. So how had your marriage devolved? I guess we should say what you're at, at this point, you're four kids in what, if you had to describe what your marriage was lacking, what it was like for you and what it was like for her to be in a Mormon mixed orientation marriage, how many years in seven years into seven the marriage, in. seven year itch, like what describe what it's like to be in that marriage seven years in for you and for your wife. For me, we were roommates. For her, we were roommates. Meaning, no, no sex is that basically? Uh, very but little. Also emotional. But we were roommates. We cleaned the house together because it was messy, and we had we had really messy roommates. They were our kids, but we kept the house together. I provided for financially for the home. She was always a stay at home mom, so she took care of the kids, which I was ultimately great for grateful for. Um, but we were roommates in terms of her just trying to, she and I both lacked this, this connection that a healthy relationship should have. That should not only be emotional, but physical and spiritual. And as a family, even temporal, all of those um, key components to a relationship were missing. If not missing completely, they were denigrated or not at the levels they should have been in. And so there was a lack of communication in our relationship because I couldn't really tell her what was going on in my brain. I couldn't really tell her what my experience was like because it was important for me to not bring sexuality into the conversation. I was convinced this will go away. Why? If you think the relationship is bad today, what happens when I actually tell her that I'm gay and trying to make this work? So seven years in, she had no idea. No idea. She knew for sure. We both were absolutely aware that there was an elephant in the room. But what she wasn't aware of was the name of that elephant, what the mannerisms of that elephant elephant were, and how to understand life with an elephant living in your living room. That was a difficult part so of it. So to her, something was off, but she didn't know she why. She didn't know what it was. And you knew what it was. I 100% you knew just what it was. You were going to tell her. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, being laying in a bathtub, listening to these podcasts should have been indication enough that there I was creating distance between us. And and that wasn't the only experience. I mean, there, there was, there was a disconnect in our relationship and it was really, she did on many occasions try to force something out of me, just be honest with me, tell me what's going on. Not, not that she was aiming for sexuality issues, but she was just, I think really trying to pry and understand what was bothering me a lot of the economically at the time was was just due to the market, due to our, our businesses. I mean, there was just a lot of stress in the family. And I think that was an easy camouflage for me just to say that there, there are plenty of things going on in the world. Um, in our world, I'm just trying to keep it together. I, I work in a super stressful, high risk um, profession. And it was everything that I was doing just to keep the lights on and, and 
things taken care of. So I think she recognized the fact that I, I was swimming in, in stress, but I was stable enough that the family was okay. Um, temporarily we were doing fine and that's all she needed. Like that was enough. You really can hide a lot on the Mormon hamster wheel because between earning a, a good living, taking care of all the kids, serving in your church callings, um, who, who's got, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't have time for real friendship and real emotional intimacy and even sexual intimacy, it's because you're just so busy, not for some other reason. Right. And it's so easy to camouflage. Yeah. And, and I think we're all probably guilty of oh, yeah. walking that, that line. It's not just our closeted friends and family members. We, all of us. we've all figured out those coping mechanisms and, yeah. and I was the same. And I think she probably recognized those within herself as well. And so she was able to give us a little, to give me a, a little, uh, space in order to, to let that work out. And I think ultimately what she wanted to know is that like, are we okay? Like, are, are we as a relationship, as a couple, you're not planning on bailing on me. Are we okay? And I would give her enough of a nugget to say like, I'm there and, and we're pushing through. So let's just keep hammering, hammering through today's problems and tomorrow will get better. I mean, isn't that just been this whole message that there, this is the lame is like tomorrow is another day and, and the sun will rise again. And one day more. And that's what we kept giving it. That's what I kept giving it was just another just day. stay on the wheel, stay on the wheel. Uh, but eventually that, that wheel falls off. And there are a number of ways where either the wheel fall off, falls off of its hinge or I fell out of the wheel. Um, I actually think it was probably a number of, of both scenarios um, or versions of both scenarios. The wheel started becoming unatt unobtainable or non-functioning for me. And a lot of that just started surrounding my experience. The more I looked at my experience as a gay man trying to navigate a healthy relationship and a mixed orientation marriage under the umbrella of Mormonism, the more I looked at that, the more I realized that all of these well-intentioned Latter-day Saints who taught me that I was broken, that if I pursued this life, I would be alone and that I was unhappy and void of spiritual experiences. All of those leaders who continue to, to press those messages uh, seemed to revert to a different messaging when their messages were challenged. And the more we challenged those rhetorics and the more we challenged the, the messaging from the church, um, the quicker the church was ready to move from that space and create something new or create an, another boogeyman, someone else to fear, some new disaster to cling on to. And I just started picking up on that, just not only on a historical, um, through an extor a historical review, but also in my own personal life. And I, I just saw all of these things that we just discussed in the last, the last segment, all of these things just kept, I, I spent some time in retrospect and just looked at all those things and said to myself, this is the definition of, of insanity. I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different re result. And when that result is not happening, what should I expect? And how long is this sustainable? So um, that aspect, the issues of revelation, church history started building up. I wasn't seeking an opportunity to bail out of the church. I wasn't hoping that the church was not true. I just looked at my real lived experiences and compared that with the promises made in the gospel and had a really difficult time of squaring those up. Uh, the second was I was tired one night and ended up going to bed much earlier than I usually fall asleep. And I got into bed after, I think I was in the bathtub or the shower, got into bed, put my phone on the windowsill next to our bed and went to sleep. And sometime in the night, likely right after I fell asleep, my wife took my phone and this was her, this was one of those times where she just knew that something was going on and wasn't able to put a name on the elephant in the room. And she thought that if she could go through my phone, um, I think that was one part of it. Her initial approach was that she took my phone to play Candy Crush. And when she opened my phone, the first thing that she saw was my North Star chats. Here were the, these chat groups that I had been involved in in North Star. And I, in those messages, just bore my soul and just shared exactly where I was at and the struggles that I was going through. 
And here was my unsuspecting wife who only wanted to play Candy Crush. That The other thing that was crushed that evening was her whole world. What would she have read in those chats? Um, just the the dissonance that I felt. Like how, where, where, I mean, the Joseph Smith Liberty Jail experience. Oh God, where art thou? Like, why have you forsaken me? What more do I have to do in order to overcome this? Why... I feel like I am the sacrificial lamb at this point. I feel like I am the one that has given everything to the church. Where is my relief? Where is my covering? When are you here? When are you going to save me? Surely that I'm not alone. There are other people out here that are trying to make this work. There was there was nothing nefarious in any of those messages. There, I mean, I was scared to death of even doing anything that looked remotely like infidelity in in my relationship. I. I remained completely um, honest and true and virtuous to my wife. The last thing I'd ever want to do is, is sacrifice that. I wanted to make this work. I wanted to move forward with life and just be okay with who and what I was. That's what she read. And it broke her heart. If ever I felt un unconditional love, it was in those moments when she woke me up with phone in hand and said, do we have something to talk about? That was tough. That was tough space. And, and how... For her, how do you process that type of information? For me, when you're closeted and everything in your life is geared to never coming out and protecting and creating these barriers around yourself, fortresses, and I'm not talking about single levels. We're talking multiple levels of fortress to protect the world from seeing who you are behind that curtain. When you, when in just a second of waking up and seeing your phone and that, those chats, these Google groups on your phone glaring in your face, you have to make some incredibly difficult decisions in, in a moment's notice. And th those are tough conversations. That was a tough conversation. That was a tough night. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I'm just struck. I'm struck by two things. You know, you're probably almost 30 by this point. How, how old are you at this point? This, th I'm 33. So you're 33. That's the age Jesus was right around there. 32, 33. Such symbolism. <laughs> Um, so you're, you're 33 by this point, you've been married how many years? Uh, almost 10 years, almost 10 years. The most significant part of your life up until then, possibly you'd been keeping from the person who's supposed to be most important to you in your life for the full length of your relationship. That's just what scenario in the world would make it so the most significant part of a spouse's life they keep from their spouse the entire time. That's mind blowing. It's a super unhealthy and it's mind blowing. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's one thing that I'm, I'm struck with. But and it also that, was, go ahead. It, it also was standard operating procedure within Mormonism when you as a bishop had someone come to visit you and they said, I feel like I'm gay or have same sex attraction prior to them getting married. The advice that the bishops were given was enter into a mixed story. Just get married. And don't, don't tell, tell her. her. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. Yeah. So what kind of world, this is the world that was created for gay Mormons. Yeah. And then the second thing that I'm struck by is that think about the torment you're under you're like writing these Liberty Jail Joseph Smith sort of like messages of my God, my God, you know, Jesus on the cross, why hast thou forsaken me messages? And you had done literally nothing. You'd never had any gay physical interaction with anyone ever. Never kissed a, kissed a guy or held the hand of a guy ever. So, so like to contrast the level of torment where you're like probably – if not you, others who have been in a similar station are probably wondering whether they want to stay alive. And yet you had never actually done anything. That's, I, it's hard to even comprehend that. And you're in that space with those feelings and experiences surrounding you. And the messaging that you hear from the church is, you don't have to feel this way. This will be taken away from you in the next life. Is there not a greater clarion call? to those who are in those vulnerable situations to where the church says to you, if you don't want to experience it here tomorrow, 
you can be in a place where you don't experience it at all, at all, because it will be taken away from you. It'll go away. I think that's probably one of the, one of the situations when I realized that this clarion call to suicidality is coming from the very top of Mormonism in this space where they have built the messaging around this idea that sexuality, alternative sexuality, or even uh, gender nonconformity is only a trial of this mortal experience. And if you want to be completely rid of that trial and this attraction and this temptation and all of the, the words, the descriptors that have been used against the sexual minorities and gender minorities among us, kill yourself. Because tomorrow, in the afterlife, you won't have to experience this. That's heartbreaking. That's the suicide that we have to battle. Those are the friends that we lose. And, and those, are, those are the experiences that the queer person has to, has to reconcile as being a gay Mormon knowing that that messaging still exists to this very day on the website, the church's official statement today still provides that, that this is a mortal experience that will be taken away from you in the, the next life. We're in 2021 with ample anecdotal and scientific and uh, data that proves that none of this just, th th this is, uh, we don't have any evidence that it goes away in the next life. We have evidence in this life that it doesn't change and that we have to embrace it. Uh, the church is still not there. They're, they're still not in a position where they'll embrace that that language. They still want change therapy. They still want us to believe that this all goes away. And and a lot of that was that conversation. So, I mean, how how do you ruin the experience of your wife or your your husband in some respects? They, uh, your spouse in those those moments deserve your true an honest fidelity, both spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And, and for my wife, um, I think some of the greatest things she had to battle was that betrayal trauma. This idea that she didn't sign up for this and she didn't have a choice. And, and that's, that's real. There are levels of betrayal trauma in both of our situations. I felt betrayed by the church. I felt like the church had an opportunity to shoot straight and be honest with me. Um, but I didn't get that. I didn't have that opportunity to, um, to make a rational decision. I made a, a decision based on um, a hypothesis. This was a hypothetical experience. Essentially, I was a hamster, and the church has said, we're going to experiment on you, and you and other people just like you. And, and unfortunately, I, I was a casualty of that experience. I, I entered into a relationship thinking that my sexuality would change as a component of that relationship. And when it didn't, I found myself having a really hard conversation with my wife, unsure of what the future would look like. So what did you tell her when she, when she wakes you up, has the phone in hand and says, do we have something to talk about? What'd you say? Yeah. So when you're in those moments, uh, and I think those who are closeted or have been closeted or in this situation um, can relate to the, these ideas that if someone found out about who I am, I have to have some contingency plans. I have to have some, some plans in the back burner that if my truth really does come out, what do I have planned and what is in place for me just to take off and run away and not have, there's a, there's a fight or flight um, experience that I think is a, is familiar to many of us. So my, my, in the back of my brain, I always had contingency plans trying to decide whether or not it was ever worth coming out. And if it wasn't worth coming out and someone outed me without my permission or without me being in charge of that, what would I do? And for me, um, even with four kids, I knew that if someone found out about who I was, I would leave and I would leave. I would just abandon them. I would take off. Leave the family. Leave the family. Why would they want me? Like who would want someone like me? Uh, and I had four kids. My my twins were nine months old at this time, less than a year. And I was okay. That's That should give you an indication as to where, as a faith, we are putting the mental health of our queer members. When it's okay to look at your family, who should be the center of the gospel and say, I'm okay leaving them because once they find out who and what I am, they wouldn't want me. So my contingency plan was to, I had money saved away that if 
she said, you're out of here. I literally, or she couldn't handle that messaging. I would take the money and run to an island, never to be seen again. And I was okay with that. I had come to the point over a number of years to be fine with that. And mm. when, we, when we say this is, this is a sensitive topic, but not one that we can, that, that isn't overcomable, not true. This is deep. These roots run so deep. And there's so much that, that the church is ingrained and, and f formatted around this topic that needs to be undone because ultimately we, we hurt and we're hurting people. So what do, what do you say to a wife who's sitting there on the edge of the bed holding your phone? Um, you, you try to minimize it as quickly as possible. You don't know what she did read and didn't read. In my situation, I, I wasn't afraid of what she was going to find. Um, so in terms of fidelity, there wasn't, there wasn't big issues uh, surrounding what she could have read. But how do, you, how do you process the fact that your husband is gay? And you're not. And so we had those conversations. She said, are you, are you gay? It took a long time for me to say that. To even say yes. I'd, I'd never even said it to myself in, in the mirror. Like I hadn't had, I mean, I joked around throughout a lot of my experience talking about being hella gay, but I had never really looked in the mirror and told myself, Kyle, you are gay. Because to acknowledge that would be some level of defeat that I had lost, that all of this that I'm working toward is, is for naught. And so I'd never gotten to the point where I could admit that. And that's what she wanted me to do. She wanted me to admit that that's what I was. And it was really difficult for me to do that because I didn't know if that's what I was. And it's difficult to know if that for sure was what I was without having experience on that other side of the aisle. Yeah, because you had never even held a dude's hand. How are you supposed to really know for sure if you're gay? <laughs> Amen. And again, that's, that's my messaging back to the, the church. It's like to these bishops and, and stake presidents who are ministering to people in this space. I, I mean, I, I get that your intens intentions are good, but um, the way you're doing it is not conducive to a, a healthy um, mental health situation for your, your queer members. You have no idea what the other side of the aisle looks like. And without, without understanding what the other side of the aisle looks like, how can you properly counsel and and minister to these young people primarily in their journey forward. Uh, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling to me. So I did, I, I had this conversation with her and just, oh, and it lasted hours and hours. Like we went through a lot of it. I, I discussed a lot of the, we, a lot of the things that we discussed in the previous episode, just about my experience growing up and family life and college and my mission and, and dating. I think she ultimately felt hurt, which she rightfully should feel hurt um, over over our dating experience and and the disconnection that I still felt and so we chose um, we spent all night talking all the way until the sun came up that next morning, which was it was tiring because I still had to go to work um, that next morning and we still had kids to take care of throughout the evening throughout the night and the morning and that next day it allowed me a little bit of time just to process and it was funny because it was a little bit of a renaissance for me as well. Here I was out, someone for the first time knew who and what I was, and the sky didn't fall. And again, if ever I felt unconditional love, it was in those moments with my wife as we discussed this topic. And she was so kind and, and so gentle. And she, she wanted, she, she just wanted to understand this experience. I contrast that with some other experiences where there's acts of infidelity or, um, times where the wife finds out only because the husband cheated or got caught in, in a compromising situation. That's really difficult space too, because I, I think in my situation, I would, I would prefer my situation over others only because I didn't have that extra baggage. There wasn't a cannonball or a wrecking ball that destroyed that portion of our trust and our relationship. But she, I think Honestly, just reading through, I mean, this has been the long version of answering your question, but I think for her just reading through those chats and her gain, gaining a sense of where I was at through years long discussions was enough 
that she saw that I, I was genuine in, in my desire to make this work and, and genuine in, in just trying to be a good husband. And what little and what few resources I had at my disposal, she could tell that I had worn them out to nothings. There was no more tread left on those tires. Everywhere um, I, had, I had driven, I had just taken that vehicle as far as it would go. And then to have to turn around and walk back home and find another vehicle to start all over again. She just saw that constant methodology. And, and I think it was heartbreaking to her as well. We, we mentioned Pleasantville and, and the Truman Show and, and the Matrix, those types of movies that um, many who have experienced a faith crisis relate to sort of that Truman Show moment. If, you remember, if you've seen the Truman Show where the, the lights fall out of the sky and crash onto the street and Truman's looking around and it's kind of that first moment that he, that he realizes there's something up, there's something wrong. And then there's that moment later in any of these movies where the person just realizes that um, everything that they thought was wrong and where it all makes sense once they realize what the reality truly is. Does that make sense? And we've talked about that from a faith crisis perspective. And we've, we've talked about that to some extent about, um, you know, the, the gay Mormon perspective that have had to have been a powerful moment for your wife as she was trying to, in her mind, make sense of the courtship, make sense of the lack of int intimacy in the marriage, how you guys had grown apart. That must have been a really, I, and I wish, I wish we had her here to kind of tell her side of the story in some ways, but what, what must have that been like for her? to to learn this horrific thing and to discover the answer that allows everything to make sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, and her response to that was, and she, I mean, you encapsulated her experience really well. She said, finally, finally, I no longer need to walk on eggshells. I thought. What did she mean by that? all of the things that she had worried about. She wasn't a good enough mother. She wasn't pretty enough. She wasn't an, uh, a good enough housekeeper. Maybe she should be out in the workforce earning an income. Was there family issues? Her family or my family? All these eggshells she walked on. And she realized it was none of those things. The disconnect was me. The disconnect was my inability to connect with her on, a, on an emotional, sexual, physical level, which are all key components of a healthy relationship. And so... But, it, but it's also so Mormon to focus on the men. And in so much of this discourse of mixed orientation marriages, it's all about what we're doing to the man, to the gay man, and we're harming the gay man, and we're making – what about what it's doing to the straight female spouses? Like we – because we're a patriarchy, we're like, oh, yeah, well, that's that's secondary. It's the – you know, even in the post-Mormon discourse, the focus tends to be on what the man endured. But what about what the straight – spouses, mostly women are, are enduring, right? Yeah. And it breaks your heart because I remember she opened her journal and there was a, there was a, a note that she obviously had carried with her for many, many years. And it was something she wrote in young women's and it was all the, all of the qualifications that she required uh, in a spouse, returned missionary, honors his family, uh, active temple recommend holding and all these things I was able to check checked all the boxes. <laughs> what she didn't have on there was straight. <laughs> yeah. And, and that was the thing I think probably like broke my heart the most. Like I qualified for everything except just that one thing. And, and so for so much of you, you want to say, I can eliminate that one thing. Like I can, I can overcome that one thing because look how many other things I was able to check on this list. I am all of these things. But the one thing that I'm not is the thing that prevents me from achieving greatness in all of those categories, which is a happy marriage. Without a happy marriage, what do we have? We're roommates again. And I don't think anybody in a, in a romantic, intimate relationship should just be roommates. There, there should be a connection in that relationship. So the more we discussed this and it went on to the, oh, sorry, I just have to say one quick thing. Okay, right. I, this is where the, again, we're repeating ourselves, but the law of chastity falls down in, in the sense that again, you and I are both for sexual fidelity. <clears throat> we're both for sexual responsibility and the fact that you weren't allowed to have a normal 
developmental teenage years where you could find out what you were attracted to, who you were attracted to, who you weren't attracted to, pursue that so you could have healthy normative courtship experiences in high school, which is what normal kids get to do, right? The fact that you didn't get that hurts you, but it also hurt her because you entered the marriage without all the information. And she entered the marriage. If we talk about informed consent, she deserved to know, you know, before she married you, what, what your, what your core sexual attractions were and the law of chastity did neither you nor her any service. And that's not to bash on sexual fidelity. It's just showing the, the holes in and the flaws with the Mormon law of chastity. And I think, I think we can find common ground in this space with the Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Because we may not have to say full sexual experiences are required. I think they're benef- could be very, very beneficial, especially in situations like mine. But why are we stigmatizing hand-holding? Why are we stigmatizing Dancing a date? Dancing together. Dancing. Hugging. Yeah. And those opportunities for, for men to... Kissing. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Why are we stigmatizing these these abilities for us to connect sexually with other humans when we are so fearful that the end result will just be sex? We are we are really damaging a large swath of our population with this with this rhetoric. And interestingly enough, early apostles would kiss each other. Early apostles would hold hands. There were signs of affection and and I'm not saying that we've eliminated all signs of non-romantic affection. As, a, as an American populace, we have. A lot of those signs of affection are gone. In some countries, especially European countries, um, salutations with a kiss are still yeah. very appropriate. Italy, we've, we've completely eliminated that out of the, the American system. But also in a very conservative Orthodox religion, anything that looks, acts, quacks, or operates like a duck has to be completely eliminated in this space for fear that you might actually get to the point where you could have sex. And, and that's really damaging. We see that even, you know, just, just pull sexual orientation out of the, the equation and look at the, for the strength of youth and see what the church has done in terms of modesty. They say, girls, you have to wear certain clothes in a certain way at certain lengths to not influence the opinions of the male boys or men who look at you. We don't want your dress and appearance to negatively impact the thoughts of these young, as if they can't control their own thoughts and as, as if they aren't already x-raying that woman below their clothes. Like they are conditioning in these methods, they're conditioning us to believe and act in certain ways that in the end, it, it, it doesn't matter. And, and what we're doing is we're hurting the individual. We're hurting the youth young woman who believes that she has now chewed gum because that, that one time she showed her porn shoulders or wore a spaghetti strap to the beach and got ridiculed by her young women's president or a bishop who made a comment about how short her shorts were. Again, I think we, we need to find some common ground to allow healthy uh, relationships to form and, and not stigmatize the opportunities or availabilities of same gender experiences. Had I had that, I don't even know where I would be. Like, I don't even know all the time and all the loss and all of the bandwidth that, that it took to get to the, the place I'm at today. I don't know where I would have, would be at if I had a bishop or even a family or parents who said it's okay to hold hands. It's okay to, to go to the steak dance together and dance with another guy or a junior prom without having that ridicule. Uh, I mean, I, I think those are some of the things that we can look forward to. And again, though, that's another great example of a blind spot that exists within not only Mormonism, but, traditional Christianity as well. Yeah, for sure. So you have, you have this hard conversation, you stay up all night and, and all of a sudden just bringing back to your wife, it all starts to make sense for her. You said that for her, she said she doesn't have to walk on eggshells anymore. Yeah. Where did things go in the conversation from there? So she said, do you want to, do you want to get into a gay relationship? Is that your ultimate goal? And it absolutely was not my ultimate goal. In fact, I even told her I felt re- I felt repulsed by the idea of being in a gay relationship. I mean, even, even sexuality or sex 
as a topic to me was repulsive. It just wasn't anything that A, a had experience with or B had a desire to get into. I want to keep my little nest together. I'm not ready to dump my kids out of the nest. Don't dump me out of the nest. Like we are still brooding our chick, chicks and, and growing our little family. And what that is, is it's, it's internalized homophobia. You, just like you said, how could, if they were to find out you were gay, you were going to go off to an island because how could anyone love a gay person? That also reflects how you felt about yourself. So even once you're admitting you're gay, you're also saying, I don't want to be gay. I hate this about myself. So the coming out is not in any way joyous. It's a coming out and then an immediate self-denunciation of who you are. Am I right? Yeah, 100%. It's absolutely correct. In my experience, it was. I wasn't, there are some who can come out um, and and be okay with with that aspect of who they are um, because they, their, their life is void of so much of that shame surrounding this topic. And which I, I commend them. And sometimes I have that holy envy, that desire to be where they're at, or if I would have had that ability to be where they're at. And so I have, I have those rough conversations. I'm saying things to myself out loud that I have never said before. And I'm saying things to her that um, are, are promises for the future. And so we, we elect to, uh, to get into couples counseling and to have this, uh, this ability to Try to try to take aspects of of this new revelation, incorporate it into our relationship, and try to make it work. Uh, we hired a therapist who was well known in this space, who himself also was in a mixed orientation marriage. Um, she said, "Do you do you know of any therapists who um, you would recommend, want to visit with?" And I, my only qualifications, I said, "You're you're welcome to choose a therapist." Um, but I would only prefer to have somebody who is LDS and someone who understands uh, the LGBTQ community because I, I want to get to the heart of the therapy that's going to help me. I don't want to have to explain myself in multiple sessions and try to bring a therapist on board with what religion has done to me, where, where religion is at. And so um, she found a therapist um, who helped navigate my world a little bit. Um, he did wonders for her in terms of betrayal trauma and walking her through. Um, I think it was, it was good for her to be able to see a second aspect a, of a man who entered into a mixed orientation marriage, he himself being gay, and then contrast that with our, uh, our experience at home. And so she was able to see two separate experiences that were very similar in nature. I just didn't ever feel like I was getting the tools to help me become a righteous Latter-day Saint who was also gay without being gay. And that was really difficult in my, in my quest for personal therapy to try to hold on to a world um, while sacrificing another one. And the sacrifice wasn't that I was trying to, to claim and hold on to something that I had previously had or experienced, but I was, I was, trying, to, I was trying to figure out how to unwind myself or untangle myself from that identity so that didn't influence what I really wanted to be. And that was just an active run of the mill, white picket fence Mormon, um, just decent job, good family, lovable wife, cute kids, and a, an occasional vacation every now and then. Invernal. Invernal. Yeah. That, that really was, I, I didn't really aspire for anything more than at that point I'd resign myself to just say, if I can hold it together long enough, that's where we'll be. And so we went through a number of, of months of counseling, um, about eight months into our couples and individual therapy counseling. Um, my wife asked me a pretty pointed question one day. We were in the bedroom sitting on the edge of the bed and um, we were looking, I was looking into the mirror and she's like, what are you thinking about? And I said, I, I don't even know what I, I think I was just in, kind of in a daze, just looking through the mirror at myself and it looked back through to another mirror into our bathroom. So I kind of had this temple experience, this the ceiling room experience where you can see the endless hall of mirrors. And I just, just kind of staring into this space. Um, and she said, Kyle, do you see yourself happy in 10 years? And I sat through and looked through the mirror for a minute and tried to contemplate the best answer because she could tell like I wasn't happy. And she said, do you see yourself happy in 10 years? And my best answer was, 
well, I made it through the last 10 years. I think I can do another 10. And she said, we need a divorce. It's tough. And I think something along the lines of we both deserve to love and be loved was kind of the follow-up conversation. Uh, when you're in those moments, you realize that everything that you're doing is to avoid that outcome. None of us want to. I've yet to meet somebody who chose to get married with the intention of divorcing. That's where the wheel fell off. That's where the rocking chair lost its rocker. We both deserve to love and be loved. And I couldn't give her 100%. And rightfully so, she couldn't give me 100%. She couldn't give me what was necessary for me to have a fulfilling relationship, even though I didn't know what that looked like. All that I knew was that it wasn't working. And she was strong enough to say, you need to be happy. Even if it means... I walk away. It was almost as if she knew I wasn't, I would never do that on my own. I wasn't going to walk away, but she gave me the permission to walk by doing it herself. It was profound. It changed our lives for the better. Because she could breathe again. I could, for the first time, inhale. I was a fish, and she was a bird. And I had laid on the shore for so long, suffocating, to be with her. <laughs> and to try to experience life on the shore. We were both designed to process oxygen, for sustainability. She had lungs and I had gills. I needed to get back in the water. She recognized that. And once we had that conversation, things got infinitely better. Our conversations were real. Our discussions were deep. We began really for the first time in our relationship to work as a team, recognizing that her well-being meant more to me than my well-being. And likewise, we were finally in a relationship. We were on the same page together. And it was divorce that put us on the same page. For the second time, if ever I felt unconditional love, it was in those moments with my very best friend who just asked for a divorce. And I thank her every day for wanting that and giving me the words I couldn't say myself because I would have just kept trying and trying and trying until it got to the point where I could try no longer. And I remember a, another gay father who discussed this situation, who said, I got to the point where I had to look at my kids and let them know that I would rather them have a gay dad than a dead dad. And I saw myself getting to that point too. That there was some aspect of this that was okay, that I could be gay. And I didn't know what the future would look like. I didn't know if I would ever date I didn't know if, I, if I'd ever get in, into a relationship, but what I did know is that opportunity wasn't unobtainable anymore. 
that there was an opportunity for that if I got to the point where I could continue. And it was mind-boggling at how freeing that was, where I no longer was on my mission. One of the requirements that we had to do every month was read the Beware of Pride talk from Ezra Taft Benson. And there's a line in there that says, pride, essentially speaking of pride, is being in that position where we find ourselves worrying more about what man thinks of us than what God thinks of us. And I had spent all my life worried about what man thinks of me and what God thinks of me. I had spent none of my life wondering, what does Kyle think of Kyle? And this is so counter in, uh, counterproductive to Mormonism. Everything we learn in the church is service to other people. When we discuss anything in the gospel, it is selfless acts and never being selfish and never taking care of yourself. I like to call this the airplane experience. It's the secure your own oxygen mask before helping other people. In the event of an, this is an emergency, I am in crisis. And when we're in crisis, the last thing that we need to do is run around, running around trying to help other people. It was time to secure my own oxygen mask before trying to help other people. I had to stop worrying about what other people were thinking. I had to stop worrying about what God might have thought of me and just start focusing on Kyle and start taking care of, of what Kyle needed. And it was such foreign territory to me. It was unbelievably, fo I've never spent time trying to figure out exactly what Kyle needs. I was always concerned about somebody else, whether it was the opinions of, of my coworkers, my, my own employees, the people I was trying to do business with, my wife, my family, the church as a whole, all these people desired some portion or some amount of my attention and there was no self-care. There was no self-care. I hadn't taken any opportunity to lift myself up or to even praise myself for my own accomplishments. Those are some of the reasons or some of the things that happen when those walls come tumbling down. When, when we talk about coming out, that's the portion of coming out that means so much to us. It is pulling the curtain back or eliminating the multifaceted, multi-level walls that have been created around you as a fortress. And once you do that, I mean, you feel like a foreigner in your own skin. And, but it's also so liberating. And, and there's this opportunity to finally be free. So that was the discussion that we had. I mean, months, months later, um, after the original coming out experience, and, and it literally changed our trajectory for the better. Hands down for the better. That is such a powerful and moving story. Highlight in my 2,000 hours of Mormon Stories podcast episodes, that was a highlight. Um, and kudos, if Jamie ever watches this, kudos to you, Jamie, for that love you showed to Kyle. And thank you, Kyle, for sharing that. That was, this is breath, breathtaking, that experience. You had to be there. I mean, I, we talked about this at lunch, but I, I just want to record this thought. Uh, you can fast forward if you don't want to hear it, audience. But the church is just so good at bringing people in to help the church get stronger and stronger and healthier. And it's almost as if it's this big machine, and the fuel of the machine is people's lives. And you you feed the machine and feed the machine with your life until your life gets ground down and ground down and ground down until there's almost no life left. And then when you're there sprawled out on the sidewalk, the life almost literally having been sucked out of you, um, you know, then of course, if you leave and <laughs> you leave yourself vulnerable to the church being able to point back at you and say, see, look, see, look what happens to these people when they leave the church. When in reality, it was your experiences in the church that had ground you down. And 
Christ's teachings have somehow been twisted and perverted and distorted into be selfless, which literally means have no self. Selfless means serve the church. I mean, serve God, which really means serve the church, which really means just your whole purpose in life is to never really discover who you are, never figure out how you're wired, what makes you tick, what gives you life and is sustaining kind of the oxygen. It's to just hold your breath and be selfless, have no self, and assume the identity that's handed to you and then feed, 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 feed the church. And never at any point of time are you even allowed to stop and say, who am I and what's important to me? And you just said it so beautifully when you said, I would spent my whole life worrying about what God or others thought of you when you had never in 33 years stopped to ask, what, what do I think of me? Who am I? It's another way of saying, who am I? Who is Kyle? And if you want to be around, if you want to be around not just for your children, not just to provide alimony and child support to Jamie, um, but to be around for you, you had to step off the hamster wheel. Isn't this a novel concept? I mean, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable to me that we're in this space where we, and I'm, this is not unique to me. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. This is, this is a, this is a systemic problem in Mormonism. And, and we can change that. It isn't about loud voices and, bolstery rallies. This is you and I standing up saying, I'm doing this for me. This is my individual worth. I mean, for all of these mantras that, that we find in Mormonism, at what point do we really take them to heart and divine worth and and intelligence and opportunity and all of the things that these young women values and, and young men um, values that we speak of to our youth, when are we going to allow ourselves to stand up and, and enjoy that independence and, and to be able to thrive in these spaces? You just have to stop doing it for an organization and start doing it for yourself. For the first time, be selfish. Well, I the 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 first word that came into my mind is selfish, but I don't like that word. The second word that came into my mind is self-centered, and self-centered still has a negative connotation in today's society. But I think that's a word worth reclaiming. Self-centered, yeah, be centered in who are, who am I? What makes me tick? What gets me excited? What gives me meaning? What gives me purpose? What gives me life? What gives me oxygen? And then once I'm centered in that, it, it reminds me of a conversation Oprah once had. You can't give what you don't have, right? Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. If you are centered on self-knowledge and, and, and you're, you have the life-giving oxygen of authenticity, internal and external authenticity, then you start to develop the resources to be a blessing in other people's lives. But if you have no self, you're a dead man or dead woman or dead human walking, and you have nothing to give anybody else. You don't, you don't lose your self to then be able to give to others. You find yourself and then you're able to give to others. And that's, that should be the essence of Christianity being self-centered so that you can be of good to other people. Does that make sense? It does. And I, and I, and I <laughs> like that analogy as you were talking about being self-centered just in my, my mind, I'm imagining the sun. Do we fault the sun for being the center of our universe? No, because if we did, we knew, we didn't know the moon wouldn't hold its gravitational pull against the earth, which means our seas wouldn't rise and our oxygen wouldn't form. Like, when we when we start looking at the importance of being self-centered and the importance of all things in its order, we start to understand why it's important for us to get to that spot. 
because when things are in order and when things function as they are designed, and in my case, when I truly can live to the measure of my creation, things begin to function in harmony and things begin to, to work as they should. So, uh, yeah, it makes sense. I understand that. And I, and I think that's a great analogy. Well, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but I'm seeing how much you're able to give to the LGBT and ally Mormon community. And it's only because you're in a place of health and wellness now. You couldn't have done this back then. No, I, and that's why I say absolutely. As you time, were barely surviving yourself. You must secure your own oxygen mask before helping <laughs> other people. I see a lot of people who jump into this space with their oxygen mask still on or their, their oxygen mask borrowed to another person while they are suffocating in the space. And, and uh, it's not healthy. You, you have to get to that part where you are more self-centered. I'm going yeah. to remember that from here on out because I do like the self-centered idea. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being self-centered. No, and I'll, and I'll push back a little like, oh, John John won't say selfish because he's still, he's got too much of that Mormon uh -huh. ingrained in him, yeah. um, which I think we're all guilty of. Uh, but it makes sense. Like, I, I, I want to stew on that a little longer. I think the, I think the self-centeredness is a, is a great analogy, and it, and it can work, and it fits, for sure. Yeah. And maybe selfish works too. I don't know. I mean, I didn't like the term queer when I heard it had been reclaimed. I'm like, no, that sounds negative. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, it makes sense, but... Words can grow in you. We can, you can change their meaning. Wow. So, so Jamie, so Jamie sets you free. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hus, a um, hostile divorce. Then is that what you're saying? Super amicable divorce. In fact, I do remember her saying, um, and it made complete sense. There had to come a part in our marriage where we had to break it. That's the tough part about divorce, especially in, in these situations. And she commented, she said, it, it in some respects would have been much easier if you would have been um, unfaithful because I would have had something to say, that's what broke the relationship. There was something that damaged the relationship. But looking at our situation, it was difficult for her to say, we're divorcing because you tried everything possible to be something that you weren't. And that you tried to overcome something that you didn't create in the first position in the, in the, in the beginning. And so she really worked hard and needed something to, to kind of break that. And there was, there was one point in our relationship where she just had to push herself away. Um, we, we remained um, super amicable as we were walking our way through the divorce. We owned um, a number of businesses and, and a lot of real estate. And so there were things that we had to start dissecting um, as part of this divorce. And so we did that while sleeping in the same bed and living in the same house, um, knowing that that we were divorcing. Um, she, she also... I mean, as we were separating our lives and trying to move on at some point, I mean, she needed to, to break that. And that was wise of her. That was something that was in my blind spot completely. I, for me, I was now finally getting what I needed in the relationship, but she needed to also have that something and that something was breaking it. So there was a little period where we got a little upset with each other. Um, but I think that was by design. In fact, it was by design. That was something that she needed. It allows you to... To divorce, make a break, make yeah, a to break. make a break, yeah. yeah, to really break that relationship. Um, the result of that was we did we did amicably amicably divorce. Um, we waited until our kids were out of school. We just wanted to make sure that by the time May rolls around, the kids were out of school. They would have summer break. She wanted to move out of our home, which shocked me because we lived in a really nice, beautiful, big home and to leave me all there by myself with 6,000 square feet. I wasn't sure what the thinking was behind that. And she was just ready to get out and she just wanted, she wanted a way. That was a really difficult part of the divorce for me. Um, knowing that the halls that once echoed the, the laughs of my children would be silent. Um, I sat in this big home all by myself, almost as if it was another metaphor of the poor choices that I'd made in my life. And if I would have just tried a little harder, I wouldn't be in this situation. I would hear the kids giggling down the hall again. I would hear sounds of toys rolling down the carpet or falling down the stairs. And that I was alone by myself in this gigantic home. All these metaphors and all these experiences were just, just pouring into my brain. 
back to the, are you sure you made the right decision? Is this what you really wanted? I mean, just all those feelings of inadequacy, again, the, the systemic and, and very deep rooted feelings of internalized homophobia existed and they were trying to take root again. It's as if I wasn't able to pull all of them out and they were trying to, to reach the sunlight once again. And, and all those experiences were, were compounding themselves while she had packed up and, and moved out. And we didn't tell the community why we divorced. We didn't even tell our families why, why we had divorced. Should back up a little bit. I told my parents. I, I did sit down and, and discuss that with them, but she didn't discuss that with her parents at all. And, and we made a joint Facebook post together and just essentially said, um, we're divorcing. We're still good friends. Um, and then we kind of adopted the mantra, um, two homes, one family. And that's really the the momentum that we've gained from this, from that point forward was that we are still one family. We just have two separate homes and she, I mean, interestingly enough, um, she started dating before I ever dated. She thought for sure. And, and maybe this is a message to those women out there who find themselves in mixed orientation marriages or at the end of their mixed, their marriage. Um, and wading into the the wide and unruly world of dating again. But my wife was convinced that she wasn't dateable, that who would want a woman in her thirties with four children who just left a relationship with a gay man. And, and the reality of that was plenty of people. And we don't sell ourselves short for those, those experiences in our life that um, of course, all of us have things that we're not proud of in our, in our past, but what, what are we doing about those dwelling on them, sitting in those rocking chairs again, going back and forth only to waste all of your energy to stand up and realize you didn't move an inch running on that wheel continually to fall out. And the only thing you are is dizzy and tired and famished. She, she jumped into the dating world and started dating before I did. And in fact, I think that was probably the biggest reason why she had to make a Facebook post. Cause it seems like she was going on a date in the community and she didn't want people to wonder why she was on a date with somebody that wasn't her husband. So I think she sent Vernal's out a small town. She sent out the clarion call to say, Hey, just FYI, if someone sees us in town, um, this is what's going on. And I think it was to her benefit because she did run into a number of people that she knew. So I didn't take too long for word to spread. Um, a lot of people I'm sure wondered. In fact, I had those conversations with plenty of people all the time about it's, it's interesting how in situations of divorce, how, people want to pick a side. They'll, they'll come into a relationship, especially with mutual friends. And then they'll, they'll discuss the divorce with both sides, determine which one is the most salacious or the one that they can gain the most mileage from. And then that seems to be the, the wagon they hitch their horse to. And we didn't want any of that. Like we, we wanted to make sure that people knew that we were still very good friends, that we still were very amicable. Um, we were still spending time together and we wanted people to know that this was our decision and it was none of their business, the, the details behind that. And I think that proved to, to be beneficial to, to our story. And it helped us really just to set the relationship on solid ground. We eliminated the opinions of others and just focused on us. And again, that was, was a principle that we months earlier would have never considered. Um, but, but that's where we're at. She started dating, um, our divorce was finally official, um, and I got into a relationship and started dating a guy, which uh, I put myself out on the market, so I don't even envy anyone who is dating um, because it is such a hard world to date. And it's, it's a hard world to date being formally straight <laughs> in this relationship, jumping into a world dating for the very first time men that is, this is all foreign territory. And uh, as I kind of date, I mean, I'm still very Mormon dating. I wouldn't even hold a hand, wouldn't kiss, wouldn't anything in this date, just because I was still so Mormon, like still so petrified about um, what I could experience and, and still questioning if I really did make the right decision. Just all those feelings that, that go through your brain. You don't undo the internalized homophobia no. in 12 minutes or, or just by going on a date or two. Nope. That takes probably years uh, to, to unravel if you can ever fully unravel it, right? It does. And, and I remember um, she, Jamie had went on a date with a guy 
And she made a comment to me that just stuck in, in my gullet for a really long time. And she said, I went on a date and made out with a guy, a straight guy. Hmm. For the first time, I realized why you needed to divorce me. Hmm. I just got kissed by a straight guy. And to me, it was like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Like that, that is, that is the, the epitome of loving and being loved. And I want that. Like I, I want that for her and I wanted that for me. And so um, I started dating a guy more long-term. Um, we were in a relationship for a little bit and uh, my kids and I had a little chicken farm and we, I call it my subsidized chicken factory because my kids were raising chickens and selling the eggs to pay for a Disneyland trip and it's subsidized because chicken eggs make no money. But for my kids, it was a great little hobby. And we had, the kids had saved up like 52 bucks or something in egg money. And we were ready to go to Disneyland. It was a family vacation that we had already planned prior to the divorce. And it had all just kind of unraveled all at once. Well, we were divorced. I was in a relationship and we had a family vacation planned. So how was this going to work? And Jamie asked me one day, she said, uh, are you planning on bringing your boyfriend to Disneyland and going to California? And I said, I hadn't considered it. I mean, seriously, I thought about how this was going to work. And she said, I'd be okay if he comes with us. He's part of your family. So if you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. And so here we go. We book flights, add him to the flight, I should say. Um, and we're heading to Disneyland as a family. Four kids, ex-wife, me, and my boyfriend. And we take off into the wide world of California and experience life in this new dynamic. Two homes, one family. And uh, the interesting, the reason why I bring this up was we, while in California, we had a, to stop at, um, the kids had a, uh, some cousins, my ex-wife's brother and sister-in-law, lived in Yorba Linda. And so the kids wanted to stop by and see their cousins that they hadn't seen in California for a while. And so this was an interesting dynamic because no one on her side of the family knew why we divorced. And if we were just to arrive at their house and it's Jamie and me and my boyfriend and the four kids, how awkward would that situation be? And so that's what we did. Um, we gave them a heads up, a little bit of heads up and said, just FYI, we're vacationing um, plus one. Kyle's got a boyfriend with him. Mm. Um, this was like a second coming out experience and they were wonderful. Like her brother and sister were wonderful. Um, I couldn't say anything better about that whole experience. Like for me, it was just, it was a great way of, of paving or even laying a foundation to start beginning this new life, especially being, I mean, it's one thing to be out in public with a guy in California where no one knew you. But for the first time I was in a situation where people who knew me now knew me and now could see a part of me that I had never talked about or disclosed before, not personally or even as a family. And, and now here, there were a lot of things going on. I mean, here was my ex-wife and, and her family and me and my new little family all together in one room discussing things that were of no importance. And there wasn't, it wasn't awkward and it wasn't unusual. It was unusual. It wasn't, it, it wasn't one of those situations that I was dreading or looking forward to getting out of. It wasn't one of those, I have to, the first opportunity, the lull in the conversation, let's bail out of here because this is uncomfortable. It was none of those things. It was just a very relaxed, open, honest, fun, um, just like I was still part of the family conversation. And that meant a lot. I mean, that was, that was a changing, that was a, and I know her brother and sister-in-law will hear this. And so for me, that was a monumental experience. Okay, I got that out. Because that was another example of unconditional love. When they had every reason to be offended and upset for ruining their sis sister's life. But how they chose to react by the way we were reacting 
was really beneficial to all of us. Yeah. How and good they, is that for the kids? Yeah, a hundred percent. And so they still remain good friends to this day, even though we're exes. I, I mean, I don't even consider them ex brother and sister in laws, just good people. One family, two homes. Yeah. We're absolutely still as elements of family for sure. All right. Enough, enough crying, John. <laughs> <laughs> that was gold. That was so money. I'm loving this so much. Um, I'm trying to remember if on Mormon stories I've, I've, had on video someone discussing a mixed orientation marriage like this before. I'm not sure. I know I did an audio years ago. I'm not, I'm not sure I've done this. So this is, this is so powerful. Okay. I have a question. What is happening to your faith during all this? And I don't know if you're able to talk to Jamie, but like I'm, it's not yours to tell Jamie's story, but I'm wondering if she's able to be so loving as a believing Mormon or if her faith is evolving, but you don't have to answer that about Jamie, but I do want to hear how this is affecting your faith in parallel. I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, multi, very multifaceted earlier on all the way back into like the North star experience. I was really navigating this nuanced faith space. It seemed to me like the, the message that came out of North Star, it, it seemed to be those experiences that really were the healthiest in North Star were those where people could be far more nuanced. And and in that North Star space, there isn't much room for nuance. It's when you when your mission statement of the organization is that you uphold the doctrines and policies of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there isn't a caveat in there or an asterisk that says, and some things can be nuanced. Um, it's, it's either you're all in or you're all out. And, and that is a typical Mormon. Um, that's, that's, I think that's regular in Mormon vernacular. And so I had become more and more nuanced because the more I could bend and shift some of my beliefs, uh, the easier it was for sustainability and survivability. I had, uh, I had some key issues about revelation. Um, during, in the midst of all of this, um, there was, there were a number of things happening. Um, on a church side, they, there was a reorganization of the ward and the stake president called me in, um, with the intent to discuss whether or not I think there was, it was either a worthiness interview or a find out interview, um, to fill a vacancy in the bishopric. This was well after, uh, Jamie and I had decided that we were divorcing and to be in that situation where they're discussing future callings, um, knowing and claiming that was under the guise of revelation was just mind boggling to me because if, if my church leaders were being directly influenced by the spirit to make certain callings, clearly they should know that our family at that point was in turmoil at best where things were completely upside down and that there was no, there was no opportunity to even serve in that type of a calling or any future calling given our current circumstances. Um, I also was in through my, through my therapy. Um, I remember my therapist asking me a question one day that I think really was the catalyst to me really making the leap out of Mormonism. And he said, do you think God sends spiritual experiences to gay people? And when he asked that question, I immediately said, no way. Yeah, there's no way God would spend, send spiritual experiences to gay people. And he just, he gave the typical, hmm, like just the him and ha. Um, and he followed up on our next session and he said, uh, I just wanted to ask that question again. Maybe I didn't ask it in the right way. He said, I want to ask it one more time. Do you think God would give spiritual experiences to gay people? So immediately it took me a second because I couldn't figure out where the difference in the question was at. Do you think God would give spiritual experiences to gay people? And he said, let me just give you an example. He said, a lesbian couple, um, they, they attend a birthday party um, with 
family members. And after the birthday party, as they're all sitting there together as a family, they look around and realize that they feel really blessed to be able to be part of that family. And they feel really blessed to be able to have those opportunities of sharing those experiences, even though they're a gay couple. Would you call that a spiritual experience where they attribute those feelings of happiness to, to God? And something in my brain clicked for a second. Like I had attributed only spiritual experiences to worthiness and to uh, the ability to obtain a temple recommend or pass an interview question. And I hadn't really, I hadn't really correlated spiritual experiences to real lived experiences, realizing that perhaps God does bless us with certain things in, or, in order to uh, help us see or seek happiness in our, in our lives. So I stood on that a little longer and, and came back with a different answer. And I said, well, I think there, is, there are perhaps opportunities where God could give spiritual experiences to gay people. And the more I jumped into that, the more I just started analyzing my faith and analyzing what was important in my life, what was a uh, real belief um, as opposed to traditional belief. Um, what, what were things in my experience that were foundation bedrock principles as opposed to things that other people told me based on their experiences? What had I actually experienced and lived? Um, how could I contrast those real lived experiences with the hyperbolic or even hypothet hypothetical experiences of other people? And I, my whole world just started unraveling and I was, I was well into my faith crisis by the time I really came out um, because of those, those feelings of abandonment and, and just sheer tire. I was, I was exhausted, spinning my wheels, not getting anywhere, and, and again, having that, that Liberty Gel moment. So I had discussed, um, I mean, another key aspect of my faith crisis was the November 2015 policy where the church excluded or called um, members of the LGBTQ community uh, apostates and prevented their children from being baptized. I had a lot of fear in my gut because I didn't know what the future looked like. This was a year before I came out, but I knew that if I ever came out, my children wouldn't be able to be baptized. That was something that was real to me. That This wasn't just theoretical for you. No, it wasn't just a policy. My wife was arguing the policy and upholding the church, and I was trying to provide counter arguments. I just I remember laying in bed and and just being so frustrated that she didn't see the other aspect of this, the the real human side of the November 2015 policy. That was before. This was before we came out. Yeah. yeah. So this before I came out. So this was this was absolutely something ingrained again back in my quiver of of internalized homophobia. And do just a for just a second. We have so many listeners that have never been Mormon before. Can you explain uh, just really briefly the November, November 2015 policy by the Mormon Church? Yeah, so November 5th, 2015, um, the church released, November 4th of 2015, the church updated their uh, handbook saying that uh, children of gay members would not be able to join the church. The official process to joining the LDS church is by means of baptism. So at age eight, those children are baptized into the church. If a child um, has same-sex parents, and those same-sex parents were the primary uh, parents, or if those parents had custodial custody of the children, and their children or their parents were in a same-sex relationship, the children would have to disavow that relationship move out of the home of the same-sex parent, and then under the direction of the First Presidency, the governing body of the church, once approval was given uh, from the First Presidency, only under those three circumstances could that child be baptized. Um, that also applied to additional blessings um, or rites of passage in, in Mormonism, i.e. Uh, temple recommends or the priesthood uh, for young men. So the children were disadvantaged, problematic because Mormonism believes in um, not being subject to Adam's transgression. So children aren't guilty of the sins of their parents unless you're a Mormon in November of 2015 and you're guilty of your sins, your parents' sins um, by association 
and without disavowing those parents and that relationship, you couldn't join the church. Further, the church then said that that same-sex parent, parent in the same-sex relationship, would be deemed an apostate, um, that they were in apostasy of the doctrines of the church, and that they were to be excommunicated. Which put same-sex marriage as being worse than what in the Mormon hierarchy of sin? Murder. Worse than murder, rape, pedophilia, you know, child abuse, because you could murder, in theory, rape, engage in pedophilia, child abuse, whatever, and there isn't a mandatory excommunication. But the November 2015 policy forbade children from getting blessed, forbade children from being baptized of gay, of, of, with a gay parent, right, who's, who's same-sex married, for, forbade Mormon boys from the priesthood, caused children to have to renounce their parents, their gay parents' marriage if they wanted to join the church at 18, all of that barbaric. And it made same-sex, loving, committed relationships or marriage, which were legal by that point, worse than rape, pedophilia, um, uh, you know, uh, abuse in the eyes of the Mormon church. True? Am I overstating it? By the voice of my servant's voice, <laughs> or God's himself, it is the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, th yeah, this is, uh, that was, that rocked the world. Yeah. And more important than that, the church, the church had instituted this change quietly into its manuals, and then some prominent podcast, er, <laughs> got a hold of... Who will, not, who will not be mentioned or named at this time. He who shall not be named... <laughs> Uh, got a hold of a copy of that November 2015 policy, and uh, in his small reach, <laughs> distributed this November 2015 policy of exclusion uh, to the general masses, and it was hysteria. Yeah, um, I think that was a dark day in Mormonism. Yeah, um, the fallout of that was not only the head fake, like what direction is the church going at this point? But back to our discussions of real lived experiences, so many Latter-day Saint families with, with gay children in and out of these new, newly formed uh, relationships, in newly formed legal marriages, relationships have been going on for some, in some situations, decades, but the newly formed and legal law abiding in, and often many times, um, monogamous relationships were now deemed as apostasy and uh, mass resignations. People, people left the church by the thousands. I think in, they said in one, just one protest they had at Salt Lake, 5,000 um, name res resignations were processed just in that one rally at, at Temple Square. So this rocked Mormonism to its very core. And I'm not sure and I know, I'm, I'm positive, the church has never recovered from the November 5th, 2015 policy of exclusion, excluding these, these members out of the church. Yeah, thank you for giving that background. And so then to go back to your story, um, at the time when this comes out, you know you're gay, you're seeing the church do this, you're trying to make it all work. And Jamie, at the time, not knowing any better, being loyal and faithful to the church was defending the policy. Yeah. And, and given the, given the amount of experience she has in this space, it was completely understandable. Yeah. And I don't, I don't fault her. She didn't her. know you were gay. Yeah. She didn't know I was gay. She didn't know gay people. Gay people. Yeah. And our, our world wasn't surrounded by people in this, this top, uh, surrounded by this topic. So, I mean, there was, there was zero hate or animosity um, because that's the way she thought. I just was hoping for more empathy. I, again, being closeted and in these situations, you do have queer members of your family. You have members of your family who are LGBTQ. And when, when you say these things and some of the ways you react to certain topics, those LGBTQ members in your family pick up on these things and we remember them. A lot of this has to do with the way that we, that we, that we look for our friends and our allies in the community. And that was a way for me to try to, to judge where my wife was at in this space. And, and it, it was very telling and saddening to me that that's where she was at. Um, but I, it wasn't that I was that far away. It's just 
that's, there were certain segments of that policy that really, really, really hurt. And knowing that at some point it could influence me and our own children um, was deafening. I, I just didn't, I couldn't understand a way forward for me or for the church. So I sat my, my bishop down in a, in a little meeting um, and discussed with him a lot of the concerns of my faith. Um, there weren't, I, I mean, I was smart enough. I had read enough church history that there weren't gigantic things that rocked my faith or rocked my testimony. Um, in terms of just like when, when someone says, oh, you left the church because of the CES letter, or you left this church because of this particular teaching, none of that. I think it was more of a, a conglomeration. It was the cornucopia of Mormonism. I, I looked at Mormonism for what it was, and the more I had to dissect it, um, I essentially started at the steeple and had to go all the way down to the foundation. And, and as I continued to dissect all these parts of Mormonism that was either beneficial to me or, or part of my story, I would have to dissect it, set it off to the side and reanalyze the next part because maybe it could be the, the part that held up the steeple. And by the time I got done with this over a period of time, I was all the way down to the dirt and there was nothing left of my, my membership in the church. Everything had been dissected and, and there, were, there were things that were just inconsistent in all those parts and pieces. So I went to my bishop with that and I just said, um, here's where I'm at. I, I'm all over the place. I'd already come out to my wife. We'd already dis discussed divorce. So it wasn't about saving myself or saving my marriage or going to the bishop for ecumenical support. It was more like, he's, he says, I know there's something going on. What's happening? We need to discuss this. And so I, I mean, he literally just pulled me off to the side and we went in and we had a meeting. I just kind of, I started in with a number of issues that I had in terms of revelation, blacks in the priesthood, um, the polygamy ban. I talked about the November 2015 policy. I talked about the church's continual treatment of gays. I think I brought up gays enough that he was a little uncomfortable that I was spending so much time. And he says, look, when it, when it comes to gays, we've, the church has already covered that territory. We're all on the same page about how we feel about the gays, which was really painful to me again. Like, I, but I also didn't want to out myself in this meeting. It, it wasn't the time or the place. I went through for about an hour and a half going through a number of items. I, we discussed the CES letter um, because there were, were things in the CES letter that I thought were valid complaints and valid arguments, anachronisms. There were, I mean, just historical issues, DNA evidences, um, the Heartland model, just a lot of different things in the church that he was brilliant enough. He was a CES um, director, or what, is that what they call him? When, he's like the principal of the CES in that area of the seminary program. So it wasn't like he had just fallen off a turnip truck and become a bishop. He he was he was versed in in church history. So he said, "Look," and for a moment, I actually felt like he was really candid and and really honest with me. And he said, "Look, I trust you, and I I value our friendship. If there's something that you found out that I don't know about, I want to know about it too." Like, share your sources. Let's have a discussion about this. So I told him, I said, go read the CES letter. I said, just start with the CES letter and read the CES letter and then let me know what you think. Like three weeks later, and I'm pretty not active. In, the, in fact, I think I only went to sacrament meeting only. Um, our ward does a fifth Sunday fireside, and it was my bishop who, who then frames this fifth Sunday fireside based around um, issues that some of his members are experiencing with their faith in terms of church history. And so I have to attend this because it's, it's either his, you. yeah, it's, it's, it's in your honor. It's clearly not multiple <laughs> members and it, perhaps it could have been multiple, but the, the timing was painfully ironic that just weeks after we had this really long deep dive discussion that he comes up with all of his rebuttals to the CES. And I wasn't even like, I don't know that I've ever cleared a hundred percent the whole of the CES letter. There were just points in there that I, that were congruent and matched some of my own experiences. And I related to them and there were, there were parts of it that I thought Jeremy did fantastic. There were other parts of it that I was like, eh, nothing burger. And, and I thought were stretches. So the CES letter wasn't this grand smoke, you know, silver bullet, silver bullet. Yeah. For me at all. Um, it, it just, it was a different way of, of putting a new twist on issues that I had already had previously. So he holds the fifth Sunday fireside. 
um, it was, it was not anything I had surprised, nothing surprised me in this experience. But what did surprise me is I did start seeing some nuance in the membership. Um, he discussed a little bit about LGBTQ issues. He discussed a little bit about blacks in the priesthood, but it was always framed with, we don't have all of the, the knowledge today. Once we get to the other side, there'll be more light and knowledge. And then all of these answers will be, all these questions will be answered. That seemed to be the fallback on every one of these, um, scenarios. And, and he turned it into a little bit of a question and answer. A few of the members, um, just stalwart members were, were jumping in to, to rescue him and to defend the faith. And so it was, it was pretty evident that he didn't have answers for my questions. He didn't have answers. I mean, he's a bishop in a ward that likely was experiencing some hemorrhaging. In fact, I knew of a couple members that did leave. I don't didn't know why they left, but they did completely resign their memberships, and causing mixed faith relate mixed faith uh, marriages. So I knew that was prevalent in our ward. It's, um, this is in Vernal. This is in Vernal. Yeah, I mean, Lisa Hacking. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. She was on the podcast. That's a yeah, when, you, when you heard the, the hackings, you kind of got the sense that they were the only ones who have ever had a faith crisis in Vernal <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. When I, I know that's not true, but it surprised me that when yeah. I, when I yeah. learned that I also reached out to them. I'm like, well, welcome to the club. Like, <laughs> birds of a feather flock together. Um, it's interesting to me though, too, like, uh, and maybe we start, there are a number of members, I think in those outlying communities that are hemorrhaging because they don't have that direct, that direct contact with Salt Lake City. And it, it's one thing to be here and to be able to run down to Temple Square and, and to be able to have a, a more generalized connection to the church. And it's something completely different when you're hundreds of miles away or, or even continents away from Mormonism. And, and I think that's a very real problem for the church. Um, but also, I mean, it's history alone is problematic. And there, there are a lot of unanswered questions. For me, there just wasn't enough. The ultimate thing that really hurt my whole experience was um, he released me uh, from the young men's in that meeting and just said, if you don't feel like you're wanting or worthy of a temple recommend, and I never said I was not worthy. I just couldn't answer all the temple recommend questions, honestly, in terms of supporting and believing that certain members of the church were called of God. He said, then I have to take your temple recommend. And as such, I, I have to release you um, from your calling. I hadn't even made a home. And he had contacted my wife and asked her to come in for an interview. And in order to save face with the ward by releasing me, he wanted to call her as a primary president in order to that on Sunday, when they announced that I had been released, from the young men's, they could say, and we called you as the primary president. And then that way it was easier for them. To, if anyone ever asked any questions, it was, there was no question to be asked. They released me because they needed her in the primary. And that was the death knell. That was for me, that was enough that we had gotten to the point where the best of Mormonism was what other people thought of us. And this was a cycle that I now had learned on multiple fronts and I was done worried, worrying about what other people thought of me. And the fact that it was happening now right in my, right in my own home under, in a religion that I had devoted my life to, I was done. And it, it was over for me. I had disassembled the church well enough to know that I had no desire to put it back together again. And that I also didn't destroy um, my faith. I didn't destroy uh, what I had known um, in terms of what had been built. I set it all aside and I, and I just put it away comfortably and, and knew that if in time I wanted to rebuild that and put those pieces back together, I had that opportunity to do it. It was similar to a house of cards. There were a number of ways to take down the house of cards. You can blow it up into millions of pieces of confetti or take that card down one, take that house down one card at a time. I guarantee you, we all have 52 cards to deal with. The confetti takes years and years and years to clean up when you blow it all up. It takes much less time to, to take all those cards down and then put them away. And in time, you may want to pull some of those cards out and reuse some of those in your new house and in something that you want to create secondhand. 
you'll have whole fresh cards and you can pick and choose what was important to you. When it's confetti, it's really difficult to start putting all that, those pieces back together in order to get a card full enough to include back into your old home again or your new home. And, and that was really the philosophy that I took, just putting all this stuff away. I did that with my marriage. We just took everything down one card at a time and put it away in a box, knowing that some of these aspects of our our marriage, they they weren't painful. Like there was genuine love, there was connection in our relationship. Our family did have happy happy experiences and spiritual experiences, and there were times where we were very very close. And I didn't want to sacrifice those memories. I didn't need to sacrifice those those foundational principles of of what we had built. So I, I did the very same method with the church. I had to do the very same method with my family. I had to do the very same, uh, per, uh, recreate the, the same method with my m with my work and with my friends. It's just everywhere I went, I was taking down the parts of the house that was me behind a curtain, and the things that were were false or pretend or created. And that was the very best thing that that I could have done in order to get into a much healthier space. Mormonism is like that big oak tree that sits out in your front yard. When you pull that oak tree out, it leaves an enormous hole in the yard. And dirt and dust and debris in the neighborhood's trash, and sometimes a child or two could get lost in that rubble and in that mess. And the, the view from your window is just this pit of destruction. It was important for me to pull that tree out completely and then start refilling that hole with positive things, things that brought me joy, things that would, that would challenge me, things that I could devote my time to. I had to replace Mormonism with something else. There were aspects of my life like tithing that were still somewhat important to me. Not that I wanted to continue giving to the church, but what about my resources to other projects or to other things that I believed in? Um, I was spending hours as a young men's president, I was spending hours and hours and hours every week um, in activities. And then Sunday in my church calling and then also teaching, I needed to replace all that time that I had spent with the youth into something else. So th those were all voids in my front yard that I had to start replacing. And th the healthy part of that was I was replacing it not with dirt and debris and old pallets and garbage, but I was replacing it with things that were bringing me an opportunity at, at growing and becoming a better person. And that was really a foundation for the first time that I was finally comfortable in building on and finally comfortable in, in making some, some positive steps forward in. So, so you knew, so it sounds like kind of the divorce coincided with your decision to leave the church for the most part, more or less. More or less. Yeah. I was, I was on my way out before we announced the divorce, but it was a trigger. It, it was essentially was the house cleaning process. Mm -hmm. It was, if I'm going to make monumental changes in my life today, I need to analyze everything in my life. The, the Marie Kondo, um, experience, like I have to look at everything and say, does this bring me joy? And if it doesn't, I had to toss it. And I went through so much of, of my life and, and tried to figure out what brought me joy, what was going to bring me ultimate happiness. And some of it, I had to toss some of it. I had to just set off to the side, um, in that, that amb ambiguity, that, that ambiguous moment that I'm not sure what I could do with this, but at the same time had to recognize that I couldn't be a hoarder. I couldn't have all the stuff laying around without order. And, and that was important to me. Yeah. All right. So did you, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I guess the question that comes to mind is I'm wondering if you resigned or if you remain a member or if you're ever worried about being excommunicated once you started dating, you know? No, I resigned. Okay. Um, I just used quit Mormon. It was really quick and easy. Funny story about the resignation. I, I told Jamie that I did resign and uh, she had moved into a new ward and months, months later, months after she had moved into this new ward, um, her records were moved over into there. I was gone. Um, so I had no records. She gets a call from her, her ward, um, clerk who said that her records had just been updated. And she's like, what do you mean they've been updated? Well, she opens up her LDS tools. And after I had resigned, I was now head of household in her home in a completely different stake in a completely different ward. And I was for some reason, somehow head of household in her family with a 
different record number. So I don't know what happened internally within the church, but uh, just made another request to have them figure it out. And they indeed said, I am for sure gone. So I, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established. I have officially resigned from the church. Mm-hmm. Maybe twice. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so the story with you and Jamie, you know, two homes, one family is so beautiful. Um, leaving the church makes all the sense in the world. And um, I know we're going to have to have you back uh, to talk more, but what what should we talk about today to conclude part two? And then I think there's going to be a part three where maybe we talk more about uh, the church itself and its status with the LGBT community, but I also really want to talk about on the record and go through that as its own episode because it's it's not just relevant to the LGBTQ discussion, but it strikes to the core of prophetic fallibility and the, frank, frankly, not just lack of inspiration on the part of church leaders, but the devastating and often deadly consequences of the church's uh, irresponsible claims of, of communication with God and then how that plays out in the lives of the membership. But let's for today, that's just kind of a, a teaser for what's to come. But, but what else do you want to share about your story today? Cause there's so much there's, there's you rebuilding your life after losing your Mormon faith. There's you learning to date as a gay man. There's you maybe even, maybe even falling in love and finding what, what love can really feel like when you're loving with someone you can love with your spirit, you know, and your heart and your body and your soul, you know, there's that there's parenting, uh, you know, as a gay single dad. Uh, and then there's all the activism work that you've done. Like that's heroic to me. And I'd want to spend multiple hours just on that. So I, I, you know, I know that we have finite time. So what parts do you want to conclude with today? I think, I think the important part, just to kind of wrap up this part of the story is that this familiar territory, there, there are those who will be listening to this episode who are closeted themselves in that same place that I was at three, five years ago where you don't know what's happening. All that you want to do is be happy and, and you want to find connection you want to find your herd. You want to just be happy. That's obtainable. If there's anything that I could say, it's that you're not alone and that you're not broken and that there are opportunities for you ahead. I just been told one talk after the next, one meeting with a bishop after the next, one personal interview with myself time and time again that I could be something that I wasn't fearing that thing that I was running from. And the ultimate reality was that I wasn't broken. There was nothing for me to be fixed. There was nothing within me that was necessary to change. And we have to get out of that mindset that the only way to find happiness is by looking like everyone else. We have to get out of these situations where groups of religious authority tell us, you have to love like I do or look like I do or dress like I do in order to be favored of God. If there is a God, And if all of this is centered around the importance of family, it strikes me as wildly inconvenient that the church wants to destroy the family and my ability to create a family and to have loving relationships with my children and with my spouse, even though he is of the same gender as myself, in exchange for what? If Mormonism's great message is 
in its power of raising happy, healthy, vibrant families in this world, then why destroy mine? Because it is all of those things. It is happy. It is healthy. It is vibrant. It is not nuclear and it is not traditional. And if we want to talk about things being unnatural, that my relationship with my partner is unnatural, then so is walking on water. That's unnatural also, but it doesn't make it wrong. We need to reach into the hearts of the Latter-day Saint leaders and share with them what I know and what you know, that the people impacted by this topic are wonderful, beautiful, gifted, talented human beings with talents and opportunities to embedder this world far beyond our comprehension. I think of all of the greats, the Alan Turnings, the, the people who are the Harvey Milks, the people who have made substantial contributions to our society, who gained great notoriety for what they were able to do, not who they are. Think of all the people that we've pushed into closets. Think of all the people that we've disregarded, that we fail to mention or talk about or excommunicate or label as apostates. Think of what we're able to do with their talents in this world had we not shunned them and had we not pushed them into the depths of darkness because they don't look, act, or talk, or dress the way we do. Mormonism is losing its very greatest and its finest people. For what? To save face? To pretend like their authority is greater than that of the kings of the earth? To avoid someone questioning their authority? There are real people behind this topic. And we need to band together as Latter-day Saints, as post members, as progressive Mormons, and support humanity for who and what we are. We each have an intrinsic and, and beautiful opportunity to help other people. And we lose sight of those abilities by pushing people to the, margin, to the margins and, and by shifting them out of our focus because they don't respond the way we want them to respond. Allow them to respond with the very gifts that they were created to respond with. I wish I would have learned that as a 12 year old. I wish I would have known that someone out there would have told me or had, had a platform or an ability to reach out and say, you can do that. You're okay the way you are. You aren't broken. There really are opportunities out there for you. People will love you. People will accept you for who you are. That's powerful. And I don't know how we get there. Other, I don't know that a religious institution is going to get there for us. Parents, if you have gay children, if you're, if you're waiting for your church to reach out and ask them how their dating life is going, who is special in their world, what brings them joy, your church isn't going to ask those questions. You have to. As a community, we have to reach into the marginalized and, and no longer have a margin at all. We have to bring them in instead of, it's interesting, especially when we discuss religion and these topics of being and suckering our people. To sucker means to run to. How often in Mormonism, when we see somebody in pain or in strife or in their infirmities, to sucker means to run to them. When it comes to this topic, we run away from these people. It's time to start suckering. It's time to run to the LGBTQ community and embrace them. I don't know how to get there. I just know that I'm much closer today than I was four years ago when I started navigating this journey for the very first time. I really look forward to what the next four years will look like. And there are, there are processes in place and there are things that I've, I tried to create and advocacy channels that I've tried to, 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 assemble to help me achieve this vision, but it's going to take a lot more than just 
a John Delenn and a Kyle Ashworth in this space, it's going to take much more than a North Star or an affirmation. And it's going to take much more than just the fringe members who have been isolated from their faith traditions and, and ostracized from their communities. It will take a lot of us and it'll take us all getting on the same page and standing up for what we know is important in our lives. And what we know is that humans are important. And, and to love another person is to see the face of God. And if we're afraid of looking them in the eyes and seeing their faces, then what is God all about? Why do we need a God? If we're, we're, if we're too afraid to approach those that we have today to work with, we got a lot of work to do. It's kind of a, a topsy-turvy, upside-down world when, when a church named after Jesus Christ is telling you you're broken, you're defective, and two former members who are deemed apostates are telling you you're perfect and you're whole just as you are. That's kind of a crazy mixed up topsy-turvy world, isn't it? But that's the world we live in. <laughs> no, I, I don't disagree that that's not one of the most insane aspects of this religion. It's mind boggling. And I, 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 we could, we have a whole nother episode in, in discussing just motives and why the church would do what it's doing. And um, does it want to make itself look, act, feel and operate in a very specific way? And by pushing out, the Johns and the Kyles and the marginalized among us that, uh, that helps them achieve that. I don't know, probable, but I don't know. Um, but it, it is mind boggling that a church that is so focused on the family has done so much to, de to destroy the family. So many families, so many families. Just to end on two happy, no happy notes for today. Do you want to tell listeners, especially the gay listeners or the LGBTQ listeners that, might be wondering if, if happiness is even possible. Um, do you want to tell them where you are now in your life, just in terms of relationships, or do you want to not talk about that now? That That's one. And then I, I would just want to hear you talk about latter gay stories, why you do it, what it is, and what difference you feel like it's been able to make. Sure. So I am in a relationship. Um, I've been, uh, I've been dating a guy for almost two years now who, um, has changed our whole world. What was it like to find love? Contrasting that with what it was like for both you and Jamie. I, yeah. I, so I had a similar text to, to Jamie after kissing a guy for the very first time. It was like fireworks. It was like, unbel like just different. <laughs> and all of those, uh, what was remaining of that internalized homophobia just melted uh, into perfect insignificance. It meant nothing anymore because I finally had found a connection and it wasn't even a guy that I long-term dated. It was just a kiss. And it was amazing that just kissing a guy for the very first time, what that did. And that's hard to explain because for a traditional straight person, I mean, it's one thing to have the, a really powerful kiss, but it, it's like the best, tres leche you've ever had in your whole life <laughs> that you want to rant and rave about and tell everybody at every future party about that one time that you had the most amazing dessert because you didn't know what life was like before having that particular dessert because it was so unexpected and so life changing. That's what my first kiss was like. And then you couple that together in a relationship where things are consistent and cooperative and symbiotic. It's amazing. And you can love with your full might, mind, strength, heart, soul. You can love them with, with your body. You can love the, them with everything, not just parts of you. Yeah. When we talk, when we talk about in terms of my relationship, divorcing because we wanted to give each other the opportunity to love and be loved. That's it. I am able to offer myself completely. No reservations, um, nothing hidden, it's all of me. You, you get everything. Now, 
you can say, you knew I was a rattlesnake before you picked me up. If I bite you at the end of the hill, that's your fault. But you, you knew what you got. Um, and there's beauty in that. That, that level of, of open authenticity is so beautiful. So um, I am dating as a result of, and that, that really, my relationship came. I had, I've had a few relationships, nothing like this one. Like this, this one was different. And um, I wrote an article, or an article was written about me. I took my kids to New York City um, a couple of years ago in 2018, right before the, kind of before the pandemic. I just decided to pick up the kids and we went to New York together and, and just kind of gallivanted. And uh, there's a publication called Gaze with, or, uh, Gaze with, Gaze with Kids, GW, okay. Yeah, Gaze with Kids um, that just kind of highlight non-traditional families, um, usually gay men with children. And they're based out of New York. They picked up the story somewhere and kind of ran with it. Just this idea that here was this Mormon dad post-Mormon dad and four kids enjoying the New York's offerings. Um, so they wrote about that article and uh, Jay, my partner from Minnesota, comes across this article and uh, decides that he wants to get to know this guy who that they wrote about. And so he Instagram stalks me, then Facebook stalks me, and then goes everywhere he can go to try to get in contact with me and continues to send me messages. And short story long, he, we finally make contact. Uh, he decides he's coming out to Utah for some training after a few months of talking back and forth. And I having zero interest in dating long distance, but also in this space where I've been working with latter day stories and, and in the advocacy space, I get messages from people all the time. And sometimes it takes a lot of energy to respond to the many messages that you get. And so I just kind of bundled him in the pile of, of messages, the, the, the quick salutations, the hellos, highs, great, wonderful day, those. Well, then he offers to, he was coming to Utah, asked me if I would go out to dinner with him. Um, he pretty much stands me up. We, he was supposed to, we were supposed to meet at a, t a certain time and like two and a half or three hours later, he finally shows up. But me without anything going on and very boring in my life, I stayed there waiting for him the whole time. And I'm glad I did because as soon as I saw him, like there were some fireworks again, just he's one of the guys, he's just one of these guys that I would have never growing up or ever when I decided what I think the most probable partner would look like would be. He's probably everything opposite of all those things. Um, but just instantly when I met him, there was something different about it, about him. And so we went to dinner and then the next day we went to to dinner, spent the day together again. Um, and then he flew back to Minnesota and we haven't stopped talking ever since. And now he, we live together and, um, things are infinitely different and, and just wildly better in terms of my, my relationship with my ex-wife and kids. I'm, I think she kind of feels like she has two ex-husbands, Jay and I, because She's now remarried and, and our family still do all kinds of things together. We, I mean, we were just together. I mean, we're pretty much constantly every other week together and there's a deep friendship. Um, she and he both share the same profession in the, in the medical world. So they have that common bond together. We are in a really good spot. We're in a place that I never, ever thought I could ever be in. I'm fulfilled. She's fulfilled. Um, we have a really healthy relationship. Our kids are thriving in this space because they have three, essentially three dads who are, are looking out for them. And our family is pretty girl heavy. We only have, we have one boy and three girls. So it's just a, a good opportunity for us to love and, and be loved as a family unit. Now, in terms of the Latter Gay Stories podcast, um, not only has so we talked about this in the first episode, how I got the Latter Gay Stories podcast. It was originally the Gay Mormon Stories podcast that was here with the Open Stories Foundation and, and a podcast that you started in 2012. I never could see myself getting into the public space and discussing these topics. This is scary territory. And 
there comes with this a level of vulner vulnerability that unless you're on this side of the microphone or this side of the camera, you don't understand the, those levels of vulnerability and everything in you, your world is also put on public display. And every decision that you make or public comment that you produce uh, is easily scrutinized. And there's always going to be people who will side with you and side against you on particular topics. So it's, it's really interesting space to advocate for the marginalized. But, um, there was a necessity to show again, this, this message that I brought up over and over again, that you're not broken, you're not alone and that your best days are ahead. I needed, I just think back again to that 12 year old kid who sat in an old rusty car. Where were the examples? If I would have seen someone out there who was having a, a relationship that was thriving in its nuance, thriving in its difference, knowing that there were two men raising a family of children happily, and that they both had great jobs and they were loved in their community and their neighbors actually brought them zucchini in the summer springtime. If I would have known a relationship like that could have existed, where would I be today? I would be in a much different position. And so I wanna use the podcast and have used the podcast as a vehicle to help share stories of the LGBTQ community. I want to share those stories of normalcy. I, I want to do the podcast not only just to support the LGBTQ community, but I want the heterosexual, cisgendered, allied community, allied and non-allied community, to also see what they're missing out on and to see that there are examples and that there are positive examples. I also want to counter counteract the messaging that comes from religious tradition that says that there are no spiritual experiences on this side of the aisle, that there, there, this is a, a life void of happiness. That is absolutely not the case. I would love to show you a photo of my family and let you see how happy they are because they're their dad and their mom are thriving in their individual situations. Though my children have two dads in this relationship or, or two men who are leading this family doesn't mean that they don't have a mother also. They have the best of all these worlds. They still have a father. They still have a mother. They have two bonus fathers who are also taking care of, of this family. That's a lot of fathers. It's a lot of fathers. <laughs> and for a religion that says that every child should have a mother and a father, I say, that's great. Every child should have a mother and father, and it's even better to have another dad and, and another dad. More, and a few more thrown in. Every kid should have a mother and a father and a few more thrown in. There you go. <laughs> and, and should those situations not provide that exact dynamic, then that's why we have allyships, and that's why we have family, and that's why we have community. I absolutely believe in rearing a strong and healthy and vibrant family that thrives. And, and I really want to use my voice while I have it and the opportunities, uh, the platform that I have to continue amplifying the experiences of the LGBTQ community. And I also want to continue highlighting those dark and non or unlit areas of Mormonism that led me and so many others into those darkest corners. I, I want to shine light in there and hopefully someone down the road in leadership and it may not have to be in general leadership, but I know it's happening locally. They start to realize that when that light shines, when you know better, you do better. And when we get to know the, the real lived experiences, the people behind this topic, we finally make some changes. That is, that is the mission of, of the podcast. And that's what I want to do. And based on the, you've been doing it for how long now? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. And based on the feedback you've received so far, do you feel like it's it's started to achieve its purpose or its goal? Are you, are you getting good feedback? Uh, getting excellent feedback. And our episodes, I mean, some of our episodes will gain 20,000 views or listens. I don't know. A lot. I don't know 20,000 gay Mormons. Yeah. I don't know 20,000 gay Mormons and their families and their friends. Yeah. I don't know that many people. Yeah. Who is ingesting this content? Yeah. I think this topic, it's either I'm broadcasting to some village that's just picking it up for fun, or this topic impacts more people than we're giving credit to. Yeah. And I think that's also, a, that's also a, a message that the church needs to understand as well, that you have isolated such a large 
segment of your population that is thirsty and desperate for connection. But our, our, I don't push YouTube as much. I need to start pushing YouTube, even though all my, all the episodes do have video and audio. So we have an audio podcast episode, uh, but a video just like this episode is on the video, uh, portion of it. But we mainly run those through Facebook, but I have, uh, I think 7,800 people who follow the, or like the podcast and another 8,000 who follow it. So I, I'm in a good base of around 15 or 16,000 people just on our Facebook side of it. Um, the audio podcast side of it, we, I mean, we do really, really well with the the people who are downloading our content in audio version. And then the website, the website is full of, of resources that give people an opportunity to hold fifth Sunday firesides or LGBTQ discussions around the kitchen table about introducing this topic to their kids in a um, very Mormon style way. I've, I've tried to reach into the Mormon world as kindly as possible in order to help them understand this topic. Uh, pre-pandemic, I taught a class called uh, What to Expect When You Weren't Expecting Homosexuality, <laughs> which essentially was a coming out class or, or a, a pre-parental pl uh, plan for when your child does come out. And I'm always heartened by the parents who show up in those spaces who say, we don't have a gay kid that we know of, but we're here to try to understand this, this a little better because we had, and it's usually a niece or a friend or a neighbor or someone who come out and because of that, they're hedging their bets. And I appreciate Latter-day Saints in that space. I appreciate allies in that space who, who don't have gay kids at all, who have become some of my greatest friends because they reached into the space. I know some good friends of mine. He's a former bishop. She is salt of the earth. I've met these people. <laughs> they have, yes, they have no gay children. That they know of. <laughs> that they know of, but they do not hesitate to call up and say, when do you and Jay want to go out on a double date? We let's go to dinner and it's us and multiple other cu couples. When they asked that the very first time I almost melted, like why, why should I, why should I break down in like an emotional ball of, of sadness slash happiness when a straight couple is willing to go out in public with me, with my boyfriend and be okay with going to dinner, especially when that straight couple is a Bishop. I mean, Think of what you can do in the lives of the LGBTQ community when you make something as simple as dinner a priority as a straight, cisgendered person. Those are the types of advocacy that, that I want to see more of. I, I care less about loud, boisterous rallies and more about the individual experience and helping you as a listener and myself as a, a person adjacent to this community in, in creating personal connection. Because I, I know when you create that personal connection with someone, you will do better. And I need more people to do better. We all need more people to do better. That might be a great place to end today, but I don't want that to be the end of our conversations. Is that okay? I'm game for another round. Yeah, we'll do another round. We'll come back. Uh, we'll come back for part three with Kyle. We'll talk about uh, the church um, and and the LGBTQ experience and the church's policies today, maybe a little bit. And then we'll also talk about what is a very important um, document to me. It's it's. I don't, I don't. I mean, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but the CES letter is a super important PDF. I think uh, this uh, on the record PDF is an equally important document to the church and to the lives of tens of thousands, if not more people. So you got to check out on the record, uh, regardless of how you feel about this issue. And we got to come back and, and do an episode or two just on that document. Yeah. And the easiest way to find on the record, because I think it would be great for people to, especially if we're going to do an episode they can digest and jump into that uh, ahead of time. But lattergaystories.org backslash record, lattergaystories.org backslash record. You can also just Google it. If you do on the record LGBTQ or on the record LDS, it'll be, it's the first thing that pops up. It's been downloaded um, thousands and thousands, 20 something, thousand, almost 21,000 times. Um, so it's got enough traction there that people are, are eating it up. So that's latter gay stories slash latter gay stories dot org dot org slash record. 
slash record. Yep. Right. All right. And then scroll to the very bottom and you can download it. Beautiful. And the, the cool part about the the PDF is that it is interactive. So there are there are links within the PDF. I, I created it because the typical run of the mill Latter day Saint says, Oh, well, you may quote the church, but you take it out of context and you only take this certain specific part of it and twist it to make it sound. So I took each of these quotes um, that are not, I don't add opinion to them. The quotes are just the quotes. They are what the church has put on the record regarding this messaging. And then I add the source link to it too. So you can click on the source link and go right to the original document and read what Heber J. Grant or David O. McKay or Spencer Kimball or George Q. Cannon or Joseph Smith or whoever said it. And the beauty of technology is some of this stuff is, I just updated it. What you're seeing is really fresh based on some of the very latest Joseph Smith papers that were just released, specifically making some bold claims that perhaps even Joseph Smith had some run-ins with sexuality himself, bisexuality, um, in addition to other members of the, at that point, let's see, John Bennett was patriarch? I thought he was co-president of the church. He was also the yeah. major general of the Nauvoo, Nauvoo Legion. Yeah. Um, just a number of fascinating articles that are now coming out due to the Joseph Smith papers that paint a very queer history among Latter-day Saints. And so what is on the record is on the record. So latterdaystories.org backslash record. Yeah, and just to be clear, what we talked about at lunch is that you have – Decent evidence to support the idea, and the D. Michael Quinn, apparently, who the late D. Michael Quinn, who communicated with you, there is evidence to suggest that Joseph Smith was engaged in some gay sexual activity himself. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And clear? and so credible information. Credible about. information. We're talking about the Times and Seasons, which is church production, and this is now printed in the Joseph Smith papers. There is a link there that you can click on that. You can read from the Joseph Smith papers, the account of that Nauvoo meeting where Joseph is looking for people to cite on him to prove that he has been savory and above board with his relationships with both men and women. And a number of people, including uh, an apostle of his very own church says, I, I can't agree with you, Joseph, based on what I know. Yeah. Pretty interesting evidence. And again, the purpose of the on the record isn't to litigate or to debate. It's just to put the quotes on the record and the experiences on the record and allow the reader to take that journey into this space. And And I think that's the beauty and, and the fascination of church history is is dissecting this and, and really jumping down this rabbit hole and seeing where it takes you. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Well... Kyle Ashworth, you did not disappoint. I've been wanting to interview you for forever, for at least several years, and it's been so lovely to have you today. Thank you for coming to the studios. Thanks for sharing your story. And then most importantly, thanks for the work you do to save lives and to save families with Latter Gay Stories. And, and I hope you, I wish you only continued success um, and prosperity with your own personal life, in your relationships with your kids, with your with your one family, two households, and uh, and with your advocacy and your business, everything. May you live long and prosper, Kyle Ashworth. Thank you, John. And I do have to give you a little praise as well. Honestly, without your advocacy in this space, without your your TED Talk and your ability to reach into the LGBTQ community and then find uh, and and create a desire to reach into this space and create the Gay Mormon Stories podcast, I wouldn't have connected with that. In turn, I wouldn't have connected with you. I would not have had the opportunity to take over the Latter Gay Stories podcast and create what we have created. That machine has so much of your signature all over it, and I want to thank you for that. And, and I hope on behalf of my thousands of listeners as well. I hope that they recognize your important work in this space on their behalf.
It's sacred work. It is. I'm having so much fun. Like I've never enjoyed my life more than at age 51 right now. I just, I'm loving life. Are you, are you loving life a little bit? All 38 and a half years of it. <laughs> You're so young. You're but a pup. You're but a pup, Kyle. <laughs> I'm not much to look at, but I'm all the Lord has. <laughs> Well, we should we should end with that. Thanks, Kyle Ashworth. All the best. Keep in touch, and we'll bring you back on super soon. Thanks, John. And happy Pride, uh, Utah Pride Week and Pride Month. Uh, love an LGBTQ person, or if you're an LGBTQ person, love yourself. And let's paint this world in a big, beautiful, bright rainbow uh, this week and month and year. All in favor? Say aye. Any opposed? I don't see anybody. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you guys soon.